Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. A few quick items before we start today. There will be a Q&A session after our presentation. If you have a question you would like our panel to answer, you can submit that in the question box on the control panel on the right side of your screen. Toward the bottom of that same control panel, there is a handout section where you will find a PDF of our presentation available for you to download. Um, the webinar is also being recorded and the recording will be sent to you within 24 hours. And now I would like to introduce Phil Kendall to introduce our panelists. Hi, thank you, Amy, and welcome everybody. Thank you for attending today's webinar on navigating ISO 17025, the 2017 rewrite, and how it affects the calibration certificates. Our panelists today, starting with John Massiello, who is the Executive Vice President and Co-Founder of Massey Bioservices. Next is Jeremy Kraft, who is our Metrologist and Supervisor of Methods and Systems here at Massey. And then we have Keith Kelly, our Vice President of Quality, followed by Matt Thompson, who is our Director of Metrology here at Massey. And then we have Mike Aliberti, who is Metrology Manager at New England Bio Labs and a customer of ours. And myself, Phil Kendall, I am the product and sales manager for the calibration services here at Mass. So what we're gonna to cover today is the ISO 9001 and 17025 2017 rewrite. We'll cover what has changed, we'll go over measurement uncertainty, and there's a new one that's a TAR versus a TUR and what that means. And then understanding indeterminate, on your certs, and then we can discuss Massey certificate levels. So before we get going though, we do have a poll question. So if we can pop that up and everybody can answer that, it would be appreciated. Thanks Phil, the poll today is, does your process require accredited calibration? If you guys could just take a second to answer real quick. Let me give a couple more seconds here. Okay. And the results are, yes, 80% of you do require accredited calibration in your processes. 8% say no, and 12% say they are not sure. Well, then this should be a good webinar for those 80% then. <laughs> to understand why they may want to need accredited calibration. So to start off, I would like to hand it over to our VP of Quality, Keith Kelly, and he can explain the ISO 9001-2015 and the 17025-2017 rewrite. Keith, take it away. Thank you, Phil, and uh, welcome everybody. Glad you could join us today. Uh, interesting to see uh, the poll results there and how many people already know what they need and how many are, are not sure. And, We'll be able to cover sort of some of the, the history and why we're where we're at and what what the people really need. Uh, some of this really kind of stems back to ISO 9001. Uh, most people are fairly familiar with this. It's a universal standard uh, designed to improve any company's quality management system. It can be the corner store mom and pop operation, or it can be a Fortune 500 company. Um, it's very applicable to a wide range of business, and it really helps drive uh, quality and quality management systems. And this has been around a very long time. Uh, it was most recently revised in 2015, and some of the key focus points in that revision were to promote continuous improvement and to identify and mitigate risk. And this is something that we're going to hear as a reoccurring theme through this presentation, this idea of mitigating risk. Uh, and it uh, sort of stems and starts with this uh, ISO 9001-2015 provision. The um, 17025 is uh, a standard that is really specific to calibration and testing laboratories. Uh, so if you're not familiar with it, it, it also requires uh, that you have a quality management system in place. But then it goes a little further, a little deeper, and it requires you to prove your competency in uh, performing the measurements that you do and requires you to, to dive deeper, better understand metrology, and better support your customers 
uh, with that knowledge base. This was most recently revised in 2017, and in that revision, they acknowledged and leveraged on the uh, 2015 version of ISO 9001. And uh, matter of fact, they actually took the whole quality management section set and said, but if you're accredited to 9001, you can, that's acceptable to us. You don't have to, to uh, independently accredit your quality management system. So that was good. Uh, and then it also continued the focus uh, on risk assessment and risk mitigation. And so it, it drove that, uh, that focus even deeper directly into the Cal Labs and testing labs. What changed in the, in the current version of 17025? Well, in, in the previous version that was in 2005, there was a single sentence in there regarding measurement uncertainty and making some sort of statement of compliance. And what I mean by a statement of compliance is something like, you know, pass fail or inner out of tolerance or, you know, is a NIST class F set of weights, something like that. That's what I'm talking about as a statement of compliance. And in, in 2005, the version simply said, when statements of compliance are made, the uncertainty of measurement shall be taken into account. And that was it, one sentence. Uh, and honestly, most calibration houses ignored that sentence. They, they didn't do that. Or they would make a blanket statement that uncertainty was not taken into account, which was sort of the opposite of what the authors of the standard wanted to achieve. So when they did the rewrite in 2017, uh, they introduced a, a, a new term called decision rule. And here you see on the left is their Definition of it, a decision rule is a rule that describes how measurement uncertainty is accounted for when stating conformity with a specified requirement. And then they go on and talk about, you know, specifically if, if it's going, if you're going to say pass fail or in or out of tolerance, the decision rule has to be clearly defined and needs to be communicated to and agreed with the customer. So they're being much more specific now about that. There are two other sections uh, where that is, is mentioned. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So they require that the laboratories document that decision rule and take into account the level of risk. They talk about uh, when the laboratory reports this, they report that decision rule. And so by report, we, you know, we commonly think of those as the calibration certificates or the laboratory report. So, it went from a single sentence in the 2005 standard to referencing this decision rule in four different locations, four different sections within the 2017. These authors really wanted to drive home what they uh, were expecting the calibration labs and testing labs to do to really step up their game. Okay, great. So it's mentioned a lot. Uh, so, so again, what, what is a decision rule? Uh, they defined it as a, as a rule that describes how measurement uncertainty is taken into account when determining pass or fail or in or out of tolerance or something like that. Okay, that kind of then begs the question, what is measurement uncertainty? So to answer that, I'll now turn things over to Jeremy Pratt. All right, thank you, Keith. So now we're gonna delve into measurement uncertainty. So uh, basically in layman's terms, uh, uncertainty is the error in the measurement. Um, simply, that's really all it is. Um, big thing is, you know, big or small error exists in all measurements. Uh, that's regardless of the type of calibration or the provider. Um, NIST, for example, which provides, you know, the upper echelon of, of CALs for the United States, even has some error in their measurements. And when we request a CAL from them, they'll, they'll tell us what that is. <clears throat> um, uh, uncertainty is error, so therefore poses risk. Um, uncertainty can come from several external influences, you know, a big one being, you know, your, your environmental conditions. If you think things like, you know, your room temperature, room humidity, barometric pressure, <clears throat> even some things you might not consider, like uh, your local gravity, uh, room vibration, um, um, other things uh, like device repeatability, you know, if you were to apply the same stimulus to a device and can it repeat that same measurement multiple times, 
Uh, uncertainty can come from things like operator effects. You know, if you gave a uh, you know a widget uh, to ten different people and had to measure with a caliper, can those ten different people uh, repeat that same measurement over and over again? Um, all devices have you know a natural year-to-year <clears throat> -year drift. Uh, everything moves around due to wear and tear. You know, shipping. You know, just regular use. Um, and there are plenty of others uh, that that can affect your uncertainty. Next slide, please. And now we're going to uh, go into TAR and TUR. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll kind of explain what the uh, the terminology is first. Uh, TAR is your test accuracy ratio, and it is defined as the device under test divided by the standard. And then there is test uncertainty ratio, which is your device under test upper limit minus your device under test lower limit divided by two times the uncertainty. So going back to TAR, um, just a, a, a good example, you know, if you had a, an oven or a freezer with a tolerance of plus or minus two degrees and the uh, temperature standard you're using to check it, it had, has a uh, accuracy of plus or minus half degree, your TAR is four to one. <clears throat> so the uh, biggest downside to this is it, it really doesn't account for uh, outside influences, things like uh, calibration uncertainty, uh, repeatability, um, any of those operator effects or, or drift that we were talking about. <clears throat> and on the other hand, we have test uncertainty ratio, uh, which does take uncertainty into account. Um, gives you a more thorough explanation of what uh, uh, accuracy ratio is. And the other nice thing too is it also works with asymmetrical tolerances. So um, if you have say a set of ZZ gauge pins in, in your model shop uh, that are plus two, ten, two ten thousandths minus zero, you know, uh, this will work with those. Next slide, please. So old versus new approach. <clears throat> uh, the 10 to one and four to one uh, uh, TARs have been around for quite a while. <clears throat> they identify, um, uh, they help mitigate risk, but they really don't identify when the customer is at risk. And I'll go into that uh, in a little bit. Um, the new approach that, that Keith was mentioning uh, directly addresses and decreases the likelihood that uncertainty may influence a pass or fail decision. And with that, we can no longer say uh, a measurement is just pass or fail. Um, there's going to be a new um, um, status that we're going to explain in the coming slides. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So in, in this example, this is a pressure gauge. Um, it has 102 PSI uh, measurement. Um, in this case, our uncertainty is plus or minus one. So basically what this is saying is, if you can see the center of the graph, uh, the uncertainty is represented by a bell curve because it's statistical. So somewhere underneath this bell curve is the actual measurement. Um, because of all the uncertainty influences, you know, things like drift and operator error, calibration uncertainty, et cetera, you know, we don't have a 100, we do not know with 100% confidence of where that true value is, but it's somewhere underneath this bell curve. <clears throat> now, if, if the standard was just calibrated, you know, yesterday, we might have a better understanding of, of where that measurement lies, but you know, six, 12 months down the line, you know, things drift, um, things wear, um, all that operator error and all those external influences will, will play a role on that and it will shift this around. And until you have that device recalibrated, you won't know again as to where that true value is. <clears throat> all right, next slide, please. So uh, we've taken a, uh, calibration from a bioreactor. In this case, the customer wanted a calibration at 100 PSI. Um, they have a tolerance of plus or minus two, so those are the upper and lower limits. And I superimposed that same bell graph onto this measurement. So from that previous bell graph, the measurement was at 102 PSI. And because of what I was just saying, where we don't have 100% confidence of where that measurement is, you know, if that measurement drifted a little bit above or below, that could do falsely put this unit out of tolerance. So, you know, if it drifts above, you know, you're, you're out of tolerance. If it drifts below, uh, you're good. But 
because of the uncertainty, we, we don't truly know where that is. So this is where that new status comes into play that is called indeterminate. <clears throat> All right, next slide, please. And uh, we've taken that same um, measurement and just applied this to a, a working pressure gauge. So if, if it measures in the green, um, you're in tolerance. <clears throat> if it measures in the red, you're out of tolerance. And the two yellows are where you would have that indeterminate. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so as you can imagine, <clears throat> there's quite a bit of confusion around this. There's been a lot of questions from a lot of different people. Uh, this was a big change uh, with the 2017 requirements. It caught a lot of people off guard. So in the past, you know, a pass or fail is just a binary rule. You know, if my if my device says it's intolerance, you know, it, it should be intolerance. But from what we just showed you with the bell graphs, um, you can't always say that. <clears throat> and a lot of people are used to seeing the, the four to one without really knowing what that means. Um, you know, just because you're at a four to one doesn't mean you're not at risk. Uh, the industry is uh, lagging behind these new measurement practices. Um, a lot of our auditors um, are not used to these new concepts. So a big uh, takeaway with this is, you know, indeterminate does not necessarily equal failure. Just because you see that on there doesn't mean your, your device has failed. Uh, what you're going to want to do is, is look at the deviation between the device under test and the standard and, you know, make your own decision as to whether or not your process could have been affected. And uh, we'll go into that in a little bit more, more detail. All right, thank you. So now we're going to get into our certificate levels. So Massey offers three different cert levels, uh, levels one, two, and three. Next slide, please. So this is a level three certificate. Um, this is actually off of a K validator. This is one of the devices we calibrate. This is one of our more traditional certificates. Um, it's not accredited. Um, this is what we would call, you know, traceable to the international system of units. Um, many people are probably familiar with NIST traceable. Um, this is used for our field services. Um, this is primarily what we have provided in the past. So just to briefly go over the columns, you know, the test description is um, the nominal set points. Um, this is what we are we're testing to or we're being asked to test to. Uh, the standard is what our standard indicated or is outputting at the time of calibration. Uh, device under test, which is DUT, is what um, your device measured. And the deviation is the difference between the device under test and standard. Uh, the tolerance is the maximum allowable deviation. And the status is, you know, your, your pass or fail. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is a, an example of a level two certificate. <clears throat> so the, the biggest thing with this is there's no tolerance, there's no pass or fail on this. Um, this does add to measurement uncertainty. Um, it's, it's a certificate that's not always used a lot. Um, if you request a certificate like this, um, you need to look at the deviation and see if this affects your process. Um, and with that, um, Mike is now gonna shed some light on why a level two certificate may benefit an FDA regulated business. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks to Massey for um, putting on this webinar and also thanks for inviting me as part of the panel. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly about a level two and basically and the reason why I'm speaking on and I guess from a customer standpoint is a level two certificate is mainly designed for those who have a, a determined or a figured out process, a metrology program, an internal program, uh, a robust metrology database that they kind of fleshed out their acceptance limits on their standards. So it's very difficult from a regulated facility to get a certificate that says pass or failure indeterminate when it might actually still be in good working order for you to use against your equipment that you're using it to test with. So you know, having said that, the, the idea to, to get the level two certificate 
is if you have a, a standard and say the standard is just for the sake of this discussion is uh, accurate to one PSIG, you obviously want that piece of equipment to be calibrated to the tightest tolerance that it can achieve. Uh, it will bring you a better measurement in the long run. But if back at your facility, if you're okay with three PSIG uh, as a as a tight to tightest tolerance to test uh, to use that piece of equipment against, well, you might get a certificate at 1.1 that the unit is fail or pass and determine it. I mean, theoretically it did, but does it affect you and your equipment on your end? Probably not, because you're okay with three. So it's very difficult to take a fail, write a deviation, and you know, write a big dissertation on why it's okay. Or you could take a certificate like this that really doesn't give any uh, statement of conformity like Keith mentioned earlier. And you basically put that up against your system that's already been fleshed out and you say, yeah, this is good because we're good to three, even though this is one. And then you don't have to explain the pass, fail, and determine it. So it's really for those people who have a kind of a fleshed out process and what their standards or their equipment is able to calibrate against. So if you don't have anything kind of fleshed out in that regard, or you don't have a metrology program or a metrology software, and you didn't do kind of that due diligence of setting all that up, which is fine, but that's when you kind of want to go with the level one because Massey's doing all of that kind of heavy lifting for you. So I hope that kind of brings some clarity to um, exactly where a level two certificate would really come into play. All right, thank you, Mike. All right, next slide, please. And with that, this is our level one certificate. So this is a little bit like our level three, except we've added an acceptance limit. Uh, there's now an indeterminate status that we talked about before. And um, of course the uncertainty is there. So basically when you have a measurement that is equal or above the acceptance limit, you'll get that indeterminate. So if, if you think back to that graph that we had earlier where the bell curve straddled the um, upper or lower limit, um, this is where that indeterminate would come into play. So just looking at the, the first measurement, uh, we have a nominal uh, of zero volts. Um, in this case, the standard uh, output is zero volts. The device under test measured triple of four volts. So therefore we have an, a deviation of triple of four. And if you look at the acceptance limit, um, that is also triple of four. So that is what has triggered this passing determinant. And then in this case, uh, we have an uncertainty of um, 0 0.000061 volts or uh, 61 microvolts. So, and we'll have uh, some questions and answers um, after this is done too. So if you have any questions on this, you can ask those in the chat. Great, next slide. And with that, uh, Phil is going to follow up and uh, explain the slide. Thank you, Jeremy. And um, just saying, after the great explanation by Jeremy and Keith and Mike, um, Massey is here to help. You know, that's why we do all the free certificate levels to kind of see what the customer needs and, and supply that. Um, we do have on site a world class metrology department with over 30 years' experience, and we have a staff of um, just over 30, 30 people, both in the lab and in the field. And we do focus pretty much in the, the pharmaceutical, life science, biotech industry, but we cater to everyone who, um, who needs something calibrated. So with that, I think we're going to get some questions. So we do have a few questions here. The first question I have is, I received a CalCER mark pass and determining. What does this mean? What should I do now? Jeremy, would you like to answer this one? Yeah, so if, if you're looking at your data um, and you're just combing through them, you see a status of indeterminate, what you'll need to do is uh, look at that deviation, again, which is the difference between the device under test and the standard, and uh, you know, look at your process and see if, uh, if it could have affected it. So going back to Mike's example, you know, if, if it said it was 1.1, you know, and you have a process tolerance of three, you know, maybe it didn't affect it, but um, it should give you enough information to make that determination. Great. Now we do have another question here. 
Um, if I'm using the manufacturer's tolerance, does it matter which certificate I use? Matt, would you like to answer this one? Surely. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, no, not really. It doesn't matter which certificate you use um, based on the fact that you're, you're using manufacturer's tolerances. Um, however, I would challenge the use of manufacturer's tolerances. Most manufacturers will give you tolerances based on very perfect conditions. And even some manufacturers will only give you those tolerances for a certain period of time, um, all of which are not beneficial to what you're doing in your own companies, at your own companies. And to mimic those perfect conditions is very difficult. So long story short, no, it doesn't matter which certificate you use. However, I would also challenge that you're using a manufacturer's tolerance and, you know, take a look at what you need it for. Thank you, Matt. We have another one here. Um, question is, where do the three certificate levels come from and why? Keith, would you like to take a stab at this one? Um, sure. Uh, so the, the level three certificate has uh, really been around for decades, right? And it, it really was the typical way of presenting calibration results uh, before ISO 1720, uh, 17025 came along. It was the standard certificate that Massey used when it was incorporated 35 years ago and for the first you know, 20 years or so of that business. Uh, and, it, and it's still useful today in, in situations where the, the quality of the calibration isn't necessarily critical uh, to an important process. Uh, for instance, uh, a calibration of the scale at your at your local supermarket, you know, for weighing vegetables or something like that. You know, so as long as the display is fairly accurate, uh, there's no real danger or no real risk, in, inherent risk, in being slightly over or slightly under that true weight. So it, it's still useful in situations like that. Uh, around the Late 70s, early 80s, ISO 17025 started to, to show up and started promoting you know, improvements in the calibration and testing industry and, and ways to do a better job. Uh, but even so, ISO 17025 does have a caveat built into it. So it, it states when a customer requests a statement of conformity then that uh, the decision rule will be taken into account. And it says, you know, when the statement of conformity is being provided by the calibration house, then the decision rule will be taken into account. So the, the ISO standard actually allows for the customer to decide uh, whether or not to include a statement of compliance, like the pass fail that we were talking about. So the, the level two cert uh, is useful in those situations. So the customer who, who wants uh, an accredited calibration, the quality of accredited calibration, and something with a record of those uncertainties of the calibration process, but doesn't really want the calibration house to be determining that compliance uh, of, of the, you know, inner the tolerance, and they'll make that decision on their own. Um, the level one cert uh, the, that we were talking about is it's really what the authors of 17025 envisioned uh, as sort of the standard, or I guess the, the optimum uh, accredited calibration certificate, uh, because it has all of the information about that instrument's calibration, including um, you know suitability uh, for intended use, and, and taking that risk into account uh, by looking at those acceptance levels. So uh, really, that's going to give you the most information, not only about your equipment, but the entire calibration process that went into calibrating that piece of equipment. Hope that. Great. Actually, we have a follow-up to that, Keith. And um, it's like, when would I need to use the highest level of certificate that Massey offers? Um, okay. Yeah, so, so by highest level, we're, we're we're talking about that certificate level one, the one with all the the, the most uh, information. So that tells you the most inf information about the calibration itself. You know, not just the the result and the and the deviation, but also um, is there any potential risk based on the customer's determination of, of what that, how that instrument needed to perform, what those tolerances were that they supplied to us or, or to the calibration house? So uh, if you are a life sciences company, uh, if the instrument is part of a GMP process or operation or is used in determining a result that goes on a GMP record, you'll really want to use that highest level certificate with the 
uh, with the most supporting information and, and the risk um, uh, factored in and mitigated in that calibration. Uh, even if you're not regulated by GMP, but the instrument is used in a process that's important to you, uh, where variations in that process might be really costly to you, either you know, in time or, or money or disposal of product or something like that, then this would be a really good choice for you as well. Um, or, or another scenario, if the instrument is being used as a standard to calibrate other instruments that you own, then you, you really want to know uh, that that calibration uh, that it received is of a very high quality and, uh, and be able to transfer that level of quality to the other devices that is, it is then used to calibrate. So, uh, you know, that level one certificate will give you the information you need uh, to do that, mainly the, you know, the measurement uncertainty specific to the calibration of your standard that you can now uh, use and apply in the rest of your calibrations going forward. Great. Thanks, Keith. Well, staying with the cert level questions, we do have another one here. Um, when would I need to use a level two certificate? Um, hey, Mike, you want to answer this one? Uh, sure. So not to get long-winded again, it's it's essentially what we talked about um, when I was describing the level two. So just key points. Uh, remember, if you have an established um, kind of process limits and you kind of fleshed out that standard uh, piece of equipment or what it's going to be used against, um, if you have your limits that are higher than the manufacturer's limits, uh, much to Matt's suggestion, you know, wanna, might want to evaluate it individually instead of just default to the manufacturer's and uh, kind of see how it plugs into your infrastructure. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. If you, if you have an established um, acceptance number that's higher than the manufacturer's number, you kind of you might want to get the certificate so you can just plug it in without having to kind of write a long-winded justification of quality, you know, because Keith likes those on our end, for instance, at Massey. So just to give you an idea. And again, if you have any questions for this, you know, I know this is a Massey webinar, you're more than welcome to reach out to me at New England Biolabs, you know, we're all kind of in this thing together, so uh, feel free. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, and then another question here, can you elaborate in the slide where you talked about uncertainty posing risk? And how does uncertainty pose risk? Um, Jeremy, I think that was your slide. Yeah, uh, great question. So. If you go back to that bell curve where we were talking about, you know, um, uncertainty comes from a lot of different uh, external influences, a big one being, you know, just just normal, just drift, you know, day to day, year to year drift. You know, if if you don't know exactly where that measurement is, you know, between the time it was calibrated to the next time it's calibrated and you're now using that to calibrate, you know, an, an internal device, you know, whether that be an oven, you know, an autoclave, it could balance, you know, whatever. But um, if, if that measurement is close to the limit and your standard has drifted a little bit, there's a good chance that, hey, that that uncertainty could push that measurement out of tolerance. So, you know, there, there's a couple of things you can do. You know, you could uh, take a look at the data and, and make an evaluation to see if the process is affected. Um, at Massey here, we do what's called guard banding and uh, we will, um, optimize your units so it's closer to nominal to help mitigate that. But um, hopefully that answers your question. If you have any more, just type in the chat. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, another question here, I'm calibrating in my lab and my certificate comes back to me and it shows up as in, in the indeterminate zone. What should I do? Matt, would you like to answer this one? Sure, so, you know, maybe not such an easy answer but you need to understand what your process tolerances are what your process is capable of so that you can take that indeterminate value and apply it to the readings that were collected during a calibration time frame you need to run your reverse trace report you need to look at you know where the measurements were taken how close those measurements were taken to the edge of you know jeremy's prior uh, slide where where the yellow is or red for that matter on the pressure gauge that he showed. And you need to make the determination of whether or not that, that piece of equipment was on the edge of, of that indeterminate range and determine whether or not it impacted your process. Okay, great, great. Um, speaking of uncertainty, 
How do I calculate it? John Masciello, would you like to answer this one? Sure, thank you, Bill. Well, first of all, you need to have consistency in pretty much all the acceptable methods, right? You know, and then you wanna evaluate all your standards utilized for the specific calibration process. Uh, create some a test script with a selective repetitive assessment, all right? And calculate it against all potential variables to quantify the equipment. Okay. Uh, Masi has, uh, in the metrology group, has provided consulting services with uh, numerous companies uh, that were uh, struggling with obtaining the 17025 accreditation. And, uh, and uh, Mike, could you could you, uh, you got you got two cents on that? As far as uh, uh, yeah, I can sure. So you know, to John's point, and and kind of. If you're an in internal metrology, you're obviously not going to be operating at the primary level. So essentially, what you would want to do is you would want to take your equipment you're going to be used, whether it's a primary, uh, whether I'm sorry, whether it's a transfer standard or something like a water bath, a liquid bath, something like that. And you're going to take all that information and you're going to run some data on it. And essentially, what Massey would do is they would take that information and they would kind of crunch the data for you, and then they would spit out a value, and that value could be applied every time you use that discipline, as long as you use the equipment that was kind of folded into that equation. So it's you, you, you're you really never gonna operate at the primary level, what, what Massey does as far as like say for weights or thermometry or things like that, but you're gonna really operate at the, the secondary level. So you're gonna operate with the transfer standards and things like that. So the, the involvement in that can be had at your facility. And much to Jeremy's point, you have to be careful with the environment because that is a big contributor. So all these things would be factored in and Massey has um, speaking from experience, has several, um, you know, high high level metrologists uh, that, uh, on staff, as well as you know Keith and Quality, um, who's very knowledgeable in the process, as as you can tell from his speech. And then you have John, who, who you know co-founded the company. So you know he's been doing this for what 172 years, John. <laughs> 73. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, Thanks, Mike. Thanks, John. And like Mike and John mentioned, we, we do offer that service as a consulting if you are looking to get um, uncertainties for your processes or equipment. Uh, we'll be happy to help, just uh, you know, contact us. And I have another question here. Um, what certificate level does Massey use for their equipment? Now, uh, this is a little before that, you know, Massey is also a biorepository. We offer validation services and we do sell and rent equipment. So we calibrate a lot of our own equipment for customer use. So um, what, what certificate level does Massey use? Oh, well, I can answer that one. Um, I'd say uh, um, it, primarily uh, we use a level one certificate for equipment rentals and sales and what have you. It makes it simple, you know, you have the, um, as a commercial lab, you know, you, you, a lot of it is to manufacture specifications. That's what we, we use. Internally, um, for our primaries, Jeremy, uh, what's what's our preferred level for our primaries? Uh, level one. Yeah, we use uh, measurement uncertainty in all of our processes, you know, right from uh, where, our cal where our devices are calibrated right down to, you know, our secondary standards, um, right down to, you know, actually providing the calibration cert. So, so every part of the process has an uncertainty. They're all combined together using statistical methods. So when we give you a calibration cert, it's it's really a combination of everything from you know NIST right down to the secondary standards, right down to you know your, uh, the effects of, of your device in the process. So. Right. All right, Thanks, great. Jeremy. Right, Thanks, and that's Jeremy. where. And, um, I'm sorry, John. You want to say something? Uh, as, as Jeremy was mentioning, is that. Uh, pretty much most all of our standards uh, have, go directly to NIST. And so when we do our uncertainty, we have um, so a relatively uh, a short, uh, a shorter distance to go. <laughs> pretty much A to B on that one. Um, I think we have some additional questions. Uh, would you like to pose them to the panel? Sure, I'll read you some questions. Um, the next question I have is, we have an FDA regulated environment. Which levels are acceptable for the FDA? Anybody want to volunteer to answer this? Sounds like a key question. Uh, 
Theodore. Um, I'll, I'll add my two cents and then uh, Matt, feel free to, to join in. But uh, so the FDA is a, um, a bit of a funny animal. Uh, they do not require that you use accredited calibrations. They have not made that specification. But they do require you to, you know, identify risk, mitigate risk, uh, and, and all of those other aspects. So, um, although there, you will not find in the GMP codes anywhere, you know, the words accredited calibration, uh, you'll find that, that the vast majority, if not all of the life science customers that, that we support, uh, look for the, the level one, highest level accredited uh, calibration uh, because they want that information. One, it allows them to confirm that the quality of that calibration is good. And then if they ever have to go back to records to identify, uh, you know, if there was a problem somewhere, they've got all of the information about the calibration and the measurement uncertainty that was involved in that calibration to aid them in those investigations. So, um, so the FDA doesn't call it out by name. Uh, accredited calibration, but they but they do look for you to uh, do risk assessment and mitigate risk. And uh, the the typical industry accepted practice, uh, the, the way to do that is with an accredited uh, certificate, the, that level one certificate. So if I may just add a few brief things to that. Thank you, Keith. That was an excellent explanation. Um, I am a former bio guy and the most important thing for me going into an fda audit with a cal certificate in hand is a make sure that the cal certificate is what your quality department has agreed upon that you need there at your site super important but honestly the most important part for me is making sure that you pick the level of certificate that you can explain to the fda auditor because really that is absolutely key if you have a piece of paper in your hand that you can't explain what those readings mean or how it impacts your business, it's your toast, right? So please, if you if if you have a certificate, if you don't know what it means, if you need more explanation, please contact us. Actually, thanks, Matt. That's a good follow-on. Our level one certificate. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, but I believe our level one certificate actually comes with uh, a explanation page that covers the, the terminology of that certificate that would aid you through that that uh, interview process. <laughs> yeah, it does. It, uh, it explains all the terminology and it includes a, a sample graph uh, from this presentation as well. So, you know, if you have an auditor, you know, it's six o'clock at night and you need a quick question, hey, we've got something here to uh, explain to that guy or gal, you know, what, what this means. Or we'll give you John Masiello's cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I have another question that sort of goes along with that. Um, when are instruments adjusted to be within range during a calibration? Is this level dependent? I can see a situation where the cal cert says indeterminate and we would not know if the instrument was adjusted. Do you reach out to the customer when the as found data is measured to discuss options? <clears throat> Yeah, I, I can take that, and I think Keith would want to follow up. But yeah, we do what's called guard banding. So if if the technician sees an indeterminate status on there on the as found data, you know, he or she will know you know, to adjust the unit if it is adjustable. Um, and just to point out, there are a few units, you know, with something like a let's say a timer or um, there might be a handful of uh, device manufacturers who don't give out their adjustment procedures you know so stuff that we can adjust um if we can't adjust it we'll reach out to you and uh you know we'll give you the best option for it you know whether that be a new product or you know sending it back to the manufacturer for repair you know i think keith wanted to say something yeah, I just want to, to add a little bit to that. So in the 17025 standard, they actually direct the, the calibration and, and test houses that you, you should uh, or you must collect as found data if it's available first. So unless the customer explicitly says, hey, this is a brand new piece of equipment, all I need is, is as left, 
uh, the default requirement within ISO 1725 is that you capture that as found uh, information before any adjustment is made. So the first thing you do, uh, an, an accredited lab will do like Massey's when they receive that piece of equipment in, the first thing you do is get that baseline, that as found uh, calibration information. So you can kind of close the chapter on the previous uh, calibration interval. You know what it was when it started and you know what it's reading now at the end. Um, then once you have that data collected, uh, if, if it's either necessary, if it's out of tolerance or if it's appropriate, if you can make it better, uh, you can go ahead and make adjustments and then you have to perform that calibration again and uh, then you supply those as left values after the adjustment is made. And uh, for us, at least in Massey, we will always identify on the certificate if we have made adjustments. So you will know, uh, here's the as found. After the as found, we made adjustments. And here is the, re the as left after those adjustments were made. So you will have all of that information right on the certificate. Great. OK, I have one more audience question. Um, if you're in the audience and you have another question, send it now, last call. Um, the question is, our certs include a K factor. Could you elaborate on how this affects uncertainty calculations? So yes, they do. Um, everything is calibrated to a, a K factor of two, which is a 95% confidence level. Um, without going into extreme detail, it, it's basically like saying, you know, 95% of the time, this is where the measurement is going to be. Okay. Well, we have no further questions. So thank you to all of our panelists and to all of you for attending today. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. Like our panelists were saying, please feel free to reach out to us at any time if you have questions or want clarification on things we talked about today. The PDF of this webinar is available to download on your control panel and it does have contact information for all of our panelists right there. Um, and you'll receive a recording of this webinar as well if you missed any part of it um, within 24 hours. So thank you for coming today and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you very much for attending. Thank, thank you. Everybody, everybody. everybody talk at once. Thank you, panelists. <laughs> See you, Mike Alberti and Matt Thompson.